Okay, well, let's get into the Bible study this morning. We're picking up in the book of Nehemiah where we left off last time. If you have your Bible, you can flip over to the book of Nehemiah. It's been said that the real test of a leader is how they respond to opposition and crisis. As a leader, Nehemiah puts on a clinic for us about how to respond to opposition and difficulty. Last time in our story, through his wise and God-anointed leadership, Nehemiah turned the broken and discouraged people of Jerusalem into this motivated workforce. After making a careful assessment of the work to be done and developing a plan to accomplish it, Nehemiah presented his vision to the city officials who got psyched up and they said, let's do it. So they began this great project of rebuilding the defensive walls of the city, which had been in ruins for the past 140 years. It's hard for us to fully appreciate just how important it was for these people to have the walls of their city restored, since we don't usually put walls around our cities in our own day. In those days, though, a city's walls represented its security and strength. A city's walls were its main defense against invading armies and wild beasts coming in. When an invading army conquered a city, one of the very first things it would do is tear down the walls so that it could be easily kept under the thumb of that invader. They would be in subjection to them after that. A city without walls was weak and vulnerable. A city without walls was a humiliation for its people. A city without walls was not really even considered a legitimate city in those days. It was a town maybe, a village, a hamlet, a settlement, an outpost, anything but not a city. A city had walls. We also saw saw in this story last time the enemies of the Jews trying to discourage them from doing the work before they even get started. The opposition is led by two men, Sanballat and Tobiah. These two are going to show up again in our story today. Finally, we looked at Nehemiah chapter 3, which describes the various groups involved in the work of rebuilding the wall and what sections of the wall each of these groups worked on. Today, we're going to look at chapter 4 of Nehemiah, where we will see Nehemiah and the people facing difficulties from a number of different sources. There will be external pressure from their enemies reaching new levels of intensity. There will also be internal problems of discouragement, disillusionment, exhaustion, fear setting in among the people. The way Nehemiah handles these difficulties will teach us something about how to handle similar difficulties in our own life. The difficulties of opposition that comes against us, of discouragement, of disillusionment, of exhaustion, of fear. Two words sum up his approach. Prayer and perseverance. Prayer and perseverance. And we'll see this come up again and again as we move through the story today. Well, Let's begin in verse 1 of, ne- of Nehemiah chapter 4. It says, now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubble and burn ones at that? Tobiah The Ammonite was beside him, and he said, yes, what they're building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. We first met Sanballat and Tobiah in Nehemiah chapter 2, back in verse 10, where it says, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. These men hated the Jews, and they benefited a great deal from keeping the Jews of Jerusalem in a weak and subjected position. When Sanballat and Tobiah first heard that plans were being made to rebuild the walls, they mocked and ridiculed Nehemiah and the others, and they accused him of trying to rebel against the king of Persia. Well, now we have these two characters making another appearance in the story, And they are upping their game considerably in trying to stop Nehemiah's progress in getting the city walls rebuilt. When 
Sanballat learns that the Jews are moving ahead with their plans to rebuild the walls. It says he's angry and greatly enraged here in verse 1. The Hebrew words here literally mean to blaze up, to glow or burn with anger and go into a rage. I mean, this guy is about as mad as a person can be. And Sam Ballad, he no longer has the authority to simply order them to stop what they're doing. So he and his partners now use psychological warfare and propaganda to try to break the will of the people through intimidation, self-doubt, and creating divisions within them. Let's look at what's said in these three verses by Samballat and Tobiah. Samballat, he calls the Jews feeble. He suggests that they're useless, they're inept, they're weak, they're unable to do anything of value. He's telling them they're losers, they're failures. He asks rhetorically, will they restore it, the wall, for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it, finish up in a day? He tells them that they are attempting an impossible task. It can't be done. They don't understand the immensity of this project of trying to build the walls of Jerusalem again. They have grossly underestimated the work required. They have set unrealistic and unachievable expectations and goals for themselves. He exaggerates the size of the problem, making it appear larger than it really is, referring to the remains of the walls as heaps of rubble and burned ones at that. What you're trying to build the wall out of is garbage. Tobiah, his buddy, says that the quality of their work will be so bad that if a little tiny itsy-bitsy fox jumps up onto the wall, it will just fall over. What they're doing will be substandard. It will be good for nothing. It will fall, fall short. It will fall far short of what is needed. We hear these kinds of criticisms when we're trying to do things we believe the Lord has led us to do too. These criticisms can come from both the outside and from the inside. We hear, you're useless, you're feeble, you're weak, you can't do anything of value, you're trying to do something that is far beyond your ability, it's impossible, it can't be done, you've grossly underestimated the effort required, you have set an unrealistic, unachievable goal for yourself, the quality of the work that you're doing is not good enough, it's all going to... Fail. One of the things that gives these kinds of messages so much power to discourage us and beat us down is that there's an element of truth in them, isn't there? Because alone, apart from God, we are pretty feeble. And many of the things that we attempt are beyond our natural ability to do. But we must not forget who is working in us and through us and for us. And he makes the impossible possible. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, referring to the many seemingly impossible things that he was faced with in his life, he said, I can do all things through him, Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. Opposition is inevitable when we seek to live a life that is pleasing to God. Opposition is going to come when we seek to live for the mission of God rather than just settling for survival. If we're unwilling to just accept what the enemy wants to give us, then we're going to face a fight. We can count on it. I want us to notice that Nehemiah is obviously doing the will of God by rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem but he's facing opposition and difficulty while he's doing it. This is the point. The the point is this, is that we cannot accurately measure the rightness of something we're doing based on how easy or difficult it is to do that thing. There are times when we are clearly walking in direct disobedience to the will of God and things are going really easy for us, aren't they? Don't delude yourself into thinking that because everything is going easy for you, that God is pleased with what you're doing. 
There are, are also times when we are obviously walking in the will of God and things could not get any more difficult in our life. Don't let the enemy start messing with your head, getting you to think that because things are so difficult, you must be doing something that God is against. See, some have incorrectly taught that if you are in the will of God, then things will be easy. That's not taught in the Bible. That's not exemplified in the Bible. In fact, most of the people in the Bible who were doing God's will faced tremendous difficulty and suffering. Not to scare you off, but that's the truth. The most dramatic example of this is Jesus Christ himself. He fulfilled the will of God perfectly in his life, yet he faced ridicule, the rejection of family and friends, torture, and crucifixion. All of that came along with him doing the will of God, rather than God being opposed to what he was doing. External circumstances can seldom, if ever, be used to determine the rightness of a thing in our life. The bedrock of truth that we must always begin with is the word of God, is what I am doing in obedience to the word of God, is the motive for what I'm doing as best as I can tell, a desire to glorify God and promote his interest, or to glorify myself and to promote my own personal agenda. Verse four, the story continues and This is Nehemiah telling the story himself. This is his voice speaking. He says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah does two things in response to the opposition. He prays and he perseveres. First, he prays. In verses 4 and 5, he prays to the Lord. We have his prayer recorded here for us. And uh, we have noted before that Nehemiah is a person of prayer. Here we see him praying again, and this is some kind of prayer, isn't it? I mean, it's not some warm, fuzzy, friendly, bless the bad guys type of prayer. He's praying fire. He wants God to bring judgment on them, to get these guys for what they're doing. Nehemiah, he knows that the work that he's engaged in is God's will. That means it's God's work, and Sanballat and Tobiah and the others are not insulting Nehemiah and the Jewish people. They're insulting God. This is what gives Nehemiah the boldness and the fire to pray the way that he does here. Now, I want to say that I don't think this scripture passage gives us license for praying judgment unto people like Nehemiah does here. We live in a different time than he did. We are under the new covenant of grace through Jesus Christ. We're told to pray blessings rather than curses on people. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. But our prayers should have this kind of passion. They should have this kind of meaningful punch in them. When you're facing opposition in your life, bring it to the Lord. Get him involved in your life. Pray. The second thing Nehemiah does is he perseveres. Look at the words of verse 6. So we built the wall. He and the others, they just keep working. When the criticism comes, the pressure comes, the opposition comes, he prays, and then he goes on with his business, following the call of the Lord on his life. He doesn't let the opposition knock him off course or change his focus. He remains steadfast. He lets his actions do the talking for him. The critics are making fun of the feeble little wall that they're building. And Nehemiah, he just builds the wall and he's going to let the wall do the talking for itself. Rather than taking up the challenge, talking up your own big game about ourselves, we need to let our play do the talking for us. We need to let our life and our work do the speaking for us. 
Verse 6, it also says, the people had a mind to work. The Hebrew word translated into English as mind can also be translated as heart. It refers to the seed of human thought and desire. It's our inner self. The, the phrase, the people had a mind to work, can also be translated as the people worked with all their hearts. The people worked with great enthusiasm and joy. It's beautiful to see this kind of commitment to the work of the Lord. This is how we should be doing everything for the Lord too, with all of our heart and all of our mind. See, there's no place for this hot, half-hearted commitment and effort when serving the Lord and his people. We should work at it with all of our heart. We should have a mind for the work. We're working for the Lord. We should give our best effort to him. Paul expands this idea even further for us as believers. In Colossians, he tells slaves to do all of their work as if working for the Lord Jesus. Now, if this is how slaves are to see their work, certainly free people like you and me should see our work that way. We talked a little bit about this same idea last time. In Colossians 3.23, he writes, Whatever you do, work heartily or with all your heart as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. See, this raises the meaning of everything that we do. Even the most menial tasks we're doing can have eternal significance. We're serving Jesus Christ. So think of the most boring, repetitive, mundane, mind-numbing work you can imagine. Whatever that awful job is, it can be an act of worship when we remember who we are really serving while doing it. Seven, but when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. Rather than the opposition going away and leaving them alone, it intensifies. Things get worse. You know, the same thing is true in our life. I mean, when there's opposition, there's temptation, things come that are difficult, we stand up to it, it doesn't just go away with its tail between its legs. It steps up. The opposition surrounds Nehemiah and the people on every side now. They are being threatened on the north, on the south, on the east, and the west. See, Sanballat, he's from the north in Samaria. The Arabs are on the southern border. Tobiah and the Ammonites are on the eastern border. And the men of Ashdod are on the western border. They're all coming in on them. What is Nehemiah's reaction to the increased opposition? Same thing as before. He prays more and he perseveres more. We prayed and set a guard, it says. We see prayer and action working together. There is trusting in the Lord and carrying out responsible action. We see this repeatedly in the book of Nehemiah. In chapter 1, Nehemiah prayed, and then in chapter 2, he spoke to the king. In chapter 4, they pray to the Lord, and then they build the wall. Later in this chapter, Nehemiah tells the people to remember the Lord and to fight. Trusting in the Lord doesn't mean we assume a position of inactivity. When the threat comes to Nehemiah, he prays and then he works. He posts guard. He prepares himself for the fight that might come. He gets busy building the wall faster than ever before. See, some people, they misunderstand what it means to wait on and trust the Lord. Waiting on the Lord and trusting him is not inactivity. It's more activity than ever. Waiting on the Lord doesn't mean we do nothing and watch. That's not what it means. 
It means we work hard doing our part with an expectant looking for God to do something, to bless what's being done, to multiply and amplify the effort being made. Prayer and work go together. Trusting in the Lord and carrying out responsible action go together. Anyone who tells you differently is either innocently ignorant or selling you snake oil. We see another aspect of perseverance highlighted in the next verses. Verse 10, it says, in Judah, it was said, that's the region around Jerusalem there. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. While Nehemiah is dealing with the increased opposition from outside forces, he begins to also face difficulties on the inside, among his own people. Discouragement, see, is beginning to grow among them. The honeymoon is over. See, the people were excited about the building project when they first started, but as time has worn on and the opposition from the outside has intensified, the workers begin to lose that initial drive. They're beginning to lose sight of the goal. It's looking too far off. It's beginning to look unreachable. Their hope is beginning to drain away. They're tired. Fatigue and burnout are starting to set in. Some of you guys working at... On the church, you're going, yeah, dude, you're describing me. Don't give up, man. Ideally, at a time like this, we would just get some rest. One of the best cures for fatigue is rest. Circumstances don't always allow us rest, though. Nehemiah and his workers are in such a situation now. They can't stop. They must continue. This is not a time to rest. They have to push through. They need gutted out strength and courage to persevere and not give up. They need to determine to be finishers rather than quitters at this point. They need to fight through this to the end. And this will end up being, otherwise this will end up being another failed attempt at building this wall. There's no way of getting around the reality of this. The same is true in our lives. We need to fight through to the end. We need to hang in there. We need to determine to be finishers rather than quitters. It's funny, I, I read these uh, you know, business management blogs once in a while on the internet and you know, the, the theoretical advice is all great but reality doesn't always cooperate. And this is the situation they have here. Yeah, it'd be great. Take a week off. Rest. Refresh. They can't do that. They have to push through. And sometimes we have to push through too. Because that's the way real life is. Verse 11. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. This is beautiful. This is what's happening. Is, these, is the enemies who go, hey, we're going to sneak in there. We're going to, you know, before they even know what's happened, we're just going to kill them. And then their own people who live on the outside says they come in and ten times they say, you need to stop. You need to return to us. See, some of the people started to believe all of the propaganda and the threats of the enemy, and they take it upon themselves to warn Nehemiah and the others of the impending doom waiting for them if they continue to build the wall. You need to return to us. In other words, you need to stop building the wall, and you start, need to start acting like intimidated, spineless chickens like us. We don't want to make Sambala mad. He might kill us. You need to do what he says or he will hurt all of us. Newsflash. That kind of helpful advice is not helpful. It's discouraging. These people are unknowingly being used as tools of the enemy. 
See, rather than cower to the enemy, these people should have started praying for their brothers and sisters who were working on the wall and showing up to help. Instead, they just become part of the chorus of naysayers. How does Nehemiah deal with this growing discouragement and doomsday talk and the ever-increasing opposition from their enemies? Look at verse 13. So in the lower parts of the space between the wall and open spaces, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He brings the people together and he puts their focus back where it needs to be. He reminds them first and foremost of God's faithfulness, that God is great and awesome. Sometimes we might remember to pray when facing a difficulty, but we forget who we're praying to, don't we? We forget that God is great and awesome. And that's who we're praying to. God's great and awesome. Don't measure what's possible by your own strength and ability, but by the great and awesome God that you serve. Nehemiah, he brings their attention back to the fundamental reasons for why they're building this wall to begin with. For your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes, he says. Remember why you're out here doing this thing. When you're ready to give up and give in to the temptation, remember again why you are fighting, why you are building. It's for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. And finally, as we will see in the next verses, to Nehemiah, he also reorganizes them, breaking the work into manageable pieces. Sometimes the big picture is overwhelming to look at, and it can discourage and intimidate us, can't it? Look at big problems, they say, as a lot of little problems added together. Deconstruct the big problem one piece at a time. Break it down into manageable chunks. Divide and conquer. Eat the elephant one bite at a time. You know, all those. That's what Nehemiah is doing here. And then in verse 15, it says, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of our servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Notice again how they are trusting in the Lord and taking responsible action. They are praying, trusting in the Lord, looking to the Lord for protection, and they have their building tools in one hand and a sword in the other. This is not a sign of having weak faith. This is not a sign of them putting their trust in themselves. It's just the opposite. It is their confidence in the Lord that gives them the reason and the courage to keep going, to keep working, to keep hoping, to keep persevering, to keep fighting if need be. There should be no reason to continue if they were doing it all by themselves in their own strength. They've already hit the end of their resources. Nehemiah knows that without God's help, they won't be able to complete this wall or fight off this enemy that surrounds them on every side. But with the Lord, they can do it. So in verse 20, he says, our God will fight for us. 
This is their battle cry. This is what gave Nehemiah and the people strength to continue with the work, believing that their God would fight for them. It should be our battle cry too. Our God will fight for us. You're not alone in your fight. Look to the Lord. He will fight for you. And I don't know what it is you're going through or what you're facing or what you're going to face, but I want to remind you that your God will fight for you. You are not alone, ever. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me None of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. In other words, they slept with their boots on and their weapon at their side. Praying and working, praying and working. Prepared for a fight. In closing, prayer and perseverance. They go together. Prayer looks to God for help. Perseverance is an act of faith on our part that God is indeed going to help us. Phillips Brooks, old Puritan saint, said, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Don't measure what's possible based on your own strength, but based on your great and awesome God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Nehemiah's story and uh, the compelling example that he lays before us and the way that he faces his troubles, his difficulties, his obstacles, we're challenged and encouraged by his faith and his confidence in you, Lord. And we're most encouraged as we see your hand at work to do great things through your people. And God, we look to you to do the same thing in each of our lives, that you are great and awesome. We depend on you. We look to you, Lord, and we um, anticipate your good work in us. Make it so this week, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.